Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I'm bidding a penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Wednesday morning edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. I'm Spencer Israel here with Joel Conan and Dennis Dick. The story of the day and uh, for most of the next few weeks is going to be earnings. So we'll get to as many of those as we possibly can. We'll, of course, get to the biggest ratings changes as well. And we'll take your questions uh, from our chat. Our guest today will be at 8.35. That is... Uh, Hedge fund telemetry is the name of the product, and we are joined by Tom Thornton. We'll talk about that. Uh, Joel, how's it going today in, uh, in the markets? Yeah, you don't need to guess, Spencer. S and P's are trading up three and a quarter. Uh, bumped a little bit after hours was carried through. Pre-market high, sixty-one and a quarter. We're only a buck away from that. On the downside, your all-time closing high was twenty-five fifty-seven. Our pre-market low, fifty-six and a quarter. So that's your key to any downside. Up forty-one cents here at fifty-two twenty-nine. And gold and silver continue to head south. Gold down five thirty at twelve eighty ninety. And silver under seventeen dollars, down eight cents at sixteen ninety-six. Uh, good morning to you, Dennis. You have some fun shorting some of those banks off the uh, open yesterday. I uh, wish I did. wish I had some fun short. And we talked about it on the show. And I mean, if you were playing it and taking the, you know, we've been talking about this nonstop, JP Morgan, Bank America, Citigroup all had decent reports and all got whacked, you know, on decent reports. Well, Goldman Sachs, same story there. Stock opened right up near the highs quickly in the first 30 minutes, tanked seven bucks. I tried to short Morgan Stanley off the hop, but that went through the 50, so that wasn't as easy of a one. You'd have to hold that for a couple of hours. So shaking around a little bit there. But again, the story continues that they keep selling stocks on good reports, at least the main guns. You know, we saw it with Netflix. Now, different story with IBM here this morning. We're going to jump into that earnings report here in a minute because this was a good report, and the stock is holding on to the gains. But also, IBM didn't really run up into the report. So it's been the story of selling stocks and good reports, the ones that have run up into the report, not the ones that obviously have been lagging into the report. And IBM actually was down heading into the report yesterday there. So nobody had very high expectations for it. So Big Blue comes out, Joel, and does a pretty good thing with their numbers. Spencer? Yeah, here are the numbers for IBM Q3 adjusted EPS of $3.30. It's a two cent beat sales of 19.2 versus $18.6 billion. So beat on the sales as well. They also reaffirmed their guidance for the fiscal year 17, uh, just EPS of uh, at least $13.80 is what they're seeing. Uh, I do want to note that their Q3 sales were down about 0.4% uh, year over year. Here we look. Your only problem is, I'm going to say overhead supply, one thing. So I'm going to say two problems. One is overhead supply. Second thing is, holy cow, massive resistance. If you go out to the weekly charts and look there in June, July, August, well, not quite August, but you know, basically all through the spring and the summer, in multiple highs, it's 155 to 157 area. That's right where you're getting back to. So I kind of think you could run into trouble up there. Uh, using different time frames for different perspectives. Uh, way to go there, Dennis, because I was looking on the dailies and didn't see a lot, but you could see that 155 area. We are going to the weekly chart here. Multiple highs just below 155 and just above 155. Uh, the top of those weekly highs is actually 5720. Ah, nice move. I mean, uh, this is probably the biggest update in, or potentially be the biggest update in IBM for I don't know how long, but we'll see how it reacts off the open. If you do get a pullback, I'll tell you where this thing is going to pull back to is a really good guess. Just go to your 15 minute chart here. 153 has been uh, the support on the 15 minute chart. That's only minor support. But uh, if you're brave enough to try short off the open here, there were buyers at 153 earlier this morning. They could be lurking again. 
And this is the main point. Spinner making a great point here in the chat. Um, he's saying, and I, I saw this not go by too, so I'm not sure. He's saying it's something like 22 quarters straight of revenue decline. I mean, we just had, who do we have on the show? Just had them this week, I believe, talking about that the numbers that they look at the most are revenues. Who was that? was Andrew Zatlin. Yeah. And if you're looking at just revenues here at IBM and you're looking at it year over year and you're looking at it from where they were to where they are now, you're like, wow, this business is just declining. So, you know, okay, yes, good quarter, but still, IBM's got some problems to figure out here. So I come in here chasing a stock like IBM that has been eternally hated here for basically, if you want to go out to the monthlies, the stock has been hated here for the last five years. I mean, we're up in 2013, we're up at 205, 208. We're down here five years later. And one of the biggest bull market runs, you know, that we've seen, the stock has lost basically 55 points during that run. I'm not jumping in here and chasing IBM up eight bucks because every time you seem to buy IBM when it's going up, you seem to, you know, be, you know, it seems to come right back down. Now it doesn't always come right back down that day, but I just think this is a laggard in the market and continues to remain a laggard despite having a pretty good day here this morning. And we've got the uh, Benzinga Pro uh, IBM running his calendar up on the screen right now. So look at all the red on the on the far right hand column. Look at all that red. That's their uh, the, that's that's how their uh, earnings rev their revenue is compared to the estimate uh, going back uh, what five years or so. Look at all that red. They miss. They miss. They miss. They miss. They miss. Yeah, and they're no good at revenue. Yeah, and uh, you kind of look, they can kind of, you know, people talk about manipulating the, you know, the EPS numbers. Look at all those EPS beats, but that hasn't affected the stock. Look at all the revenue misses. And I just want to contrast this. Uh, I was doing a little research on uh, UNH last night. And, uh, you know, uh, look at that. How many uh, straight revenue beats that you've had here? Oh, I haven't had an uh, EPS miss. This uh, calendar is going back to a Q2 of uh, 2012, and then uh, you can pick up your favorite stock, and you wonder why NVIDIA has uh, had the kind of run it has. Look at that. There's only been one down corner in revenues, beaten on the EPS by 50%. So I know we talk a lot about technicals on the show, but when you get down to it, it's the fundamentals that move stocks, and uh, maybe a turning point here for Big Blue. I mean, you know, and there's a great point you're making. There's so many people that just like to look at technicals, and that's great. You're just a day trader. You're short term, and you're just looking at. And you know, you can say that you know the technicals, you know, will show everything. You know, show the fundamental information. But I really feel like when you get a good grasp at all of it, you know, that technicals is one thing, but fundamentals is another thing too. I used to say this uh, when I was teaching, when I was doing some lecturing at universities, and just talking about you know earnings and stuff. If you were to just take company X, Y, Z and say they make a dollar a share. Well, if the multiples overall in the markets are around you know, 20, you would guess that that stock would be worth about 20 bucks. And nine out of 10 times, if you didn't even know what the company does, but you knew their earnings per share, you could probably get within a few bucks of where the stock is really trading. Now there's different factors, there's growth, there's all kinds of other things, but really it's still earnings that drive price. And when you, you know, have revenues declining, that's, you know, one thing, you know, what, what your guest said, too, is you can manipulate earnings to a certain extent. Yeah. It's hard to manipulate that top line. So I love that the guest was pointing that out and looking at that top line. And when you see revenues declining, you worry about the business. See revenues climbing, you know, the business is doing better. Dennis, did you get that from your CFA training? Uh, you know, the way you analyze the balance sheets and the revenues and stuff, or is that something? Well, I mean, that's what they all, you know, in CFA, okay. and, and I, I did my CFA back in 1999 and 2000. So it's, <laughs> mine's probably dated now 17 years ago, but I'm obviously very active still at the CFA Institute, um, helping them out with a lot of different things. Um, the one thing, you know, is that they really focus on, uh, like I'll say they have some technical analysis in the CFA program but it's very limited. Like 90% of it is fundamental based. And it really go, it really is, you know, at the heart of it all. I mean, valuation in the long term always still matters. I mean, if you have a company that is never going to make a profit or if revenue is declining, it's going to get killed. Growth, you know, can compensate and, you know, valuation could get ignored for a long time if you've got great growth. But if you've got great growth, your valuation is going to be, you know, looking more attractive as you grow as well. So still at the heart of it all, at the heart of it all, I don't care, you know, what anybody else says is valuation. And when companies, you know, are trading at a significant discount to maybe where they should be, if you're that analyst, you got that long term, you know, time horizon there, that strategy, I think, still works. And that's how I've always played it in my investment portfolio. That's how Warren Buffett has played it, you know, buying 
good companies at reasonable valuations. Uh, Carter Worth said last night on CNBC, he used the term GARP. I love that term. It's growth at a reasonable price. Love to have growth. Love to have it. In this market, it's hard to get growth, though, at a reasonable price because everybody wants to pay through the roof for the growth. And it's cycles. Back in 2007, 2008, 2009, during the financial crisis, you could get growth all over the place <laughs> at discount prices because people were throwing out everything back then. So, you know, it just goes to show you there's certain times where, you know, you need to invest a little heavier and there's certain times where you need to maybe lay off the investing. Lately, I have not been doing a lot of investing in my long term portfolio, at least not in some of these sectors, because it's growth are, and the valuations are extended. I mean, when s and trained 22, 23 times and we were 14 or 15 times a few years ago, it is overextended right now. That being said, you still have lots of trades. There's still, you know, lots of opportunities in this market. You just got to be careful with obviously what, um, you know, you're trading and what you're investing in. All right, that's our uh, tat, our fundamental rant. We got some more earnings to cover. Yeah, so we did IBM. Let's jump into uh, LRCX from last night. A lot of people trade like to trade Lamb Research. Uh, this stock was all over the place. It popped, it dropped, it popped, it dropped, it popped. Really yo-yo action there. If you look at the after hours chart, Spencer, give us the details. Q3 adjusted EPS, $3.46 for us, $3.28. So a nice EPS beat sales of $2.478 billion for us, $2.47. So just about in line is for the, with the sales number. Uh, as far as Q4 guidance is concerned, coming in higher than the estimate. The estimate was $3.33 for Q4 EPS. What they actually said it'll be is $3.53 to $3.77. Uh, sales coming in uh, in line. And the stock yo-yo action, Joel, what did you make of that? If you look at the after hours action, look at the, you know, the, the daily yeah. chart here. What do you make of LRCX? I'm just, you know, this is a pretty easy one because you had a nice day yesterday. You made an all time high at 95.49. I'm discounting that 96.99 uh, print. I think that was just an odd lot there. So, right, just keep your eye on that close. We're in the red a little bit. If it goes green, I'm looking for 95.49. That's your all time high. You got good support here. Yesterday's low is still two, three bucks away. So the big boys are going to be looking at that close at 194.55. That's what I'm going to be focusing on. Well, if I'm trading LIRCX. Also reporting last night was Interactive Brokers, IBKR. Uh, the stock was getting a pop last night. It's bid up here this morning, no volume this morning. Bid up over $48, and it, but was trading last night at $48.90, which actually is an all-time high. These retail brokers have been on fire. IBKR, uh, the report there, Spencer. Yep, always interesting to see how the uh, the retail brokerages do when the market's at all-time highs. IBKR Q3 EPS, $0.43 cents is a $0.05 cent beat. Sales of four hundred twenty-six million versus three hundred eighty-five and a half million. So they beat on the top and they beat on the bottom. Stock breaking out all-time highs. Yeah. I'm Fifty bucks. I mean, if you really want to find the big whole number, like there's lots. It's forty-eight, wow. forty-nine offers. So I'm not sure you're going to see that here, but sometimes these things can get crazy. I think you know that's the big psychological level that I'm looking at. If it takes out, and in the regular session, if it does take out that forty-eight, fifteen high, that could be the next stopping point. Um. Looking at the trading from yesterday, as Dennis mentioned, a tight range yesterday, really some major consolidation just ahead of the report. Now that we're breaking out above the consolidation here, uh, 48.15, what's your last print here? 48.90. So you have to use that as support here. Two things about this stock. One, this is a low volatility environment, right? I mean, so usually when there's more trading, low volume, very impressive. Second is, did they give any numbers regard? I mean, they were, they're going into credit cards. They're getting in. They're really expanding their business. They're getting in more to uh, trying to be a bank slash broker. Because if you think I, about I didn't it, know that. You didn't know that? Yeah, I almost no. bought the stock at the market when I heard this was a couple of weeks ago. Because if you think about it, where's the majority of your assets? Where is your, you know, 99% of your money is really probably in your broker. I won't say 99%, but a good amount of your money is in your brokerage accounts. And if you're not fully margin, which hopefully none of our, our traders are, that's money you can use, you know, for loans, for all kinds of different things. So I thought that was very interesting. I'm not sure if it was reflected in this uh, report, but uh, what's the guy that's, uh, that, that, that started the interactive brokers? I forget his name. Butterfee. Oh, Butterfee. yeah. 
man oh man what a genius shouldn't it ever oh, be genius absolute genius here uh really was one of the first guys to get into the options markets and the options pricing so can't bet against this stock maybe i'll wait till it comes back down to that 48 dollar level for a lower risk buy morning this morning abbott labs abt still on this one in my investment portfolio i've had it in there for a while it's been a good one uh 56 bucks is where it's trading that is i believe a new all-time high for abbott labs here as well um stock reported earnings spencer about a half an hour ago thoughts on this one or actually give us a report then joel jump in it 66 cents and beat by a penny sales of 6.8 for 6.72 billion dollars they also uh, narrowed their uh fiscal year uh, EPS outlook and their Q4 adjusted EPS guidance coming in uh, in line with the estimate. 74 cents was the estimate. 72 to 74 cents is what they said it'll be. So mostly in line guidance uh, and a mostly in line earnings report. Mm, nice. Well, yeah. It's a tough one, Joel. Yeah, tough one here. Is that all? All right, because it's had it spun some stuff off here. Uh, you're, Abby. Yeah, yeah, you're happy about it. You got that for zero, ago. right? You got that. For, What's that? You got that for zero, right? Yeah. I got that for zero. I just I had Abbott Labs, and they I, I had a, uh, my shares of Abbott Labs, and they gave me an equivalent amount of shares of Abby when they spun that off. And now I've got both stocks, and Abby's worth ninety-two bucks, and Abbott Labs worth fifty-six. So I basically got to add up those two stock prices to say where you know I'm really up within the stock. Because I bought Abbott Labs back, I think, in 2012 at 48, but then I got Abby, so I'm up eight points in Abbott Labs, and I'm up 92 points in Abby because they just gave me that for zero. So pretty good deal. Yeah, nice trade there. Nice, uh, nice long-term that's hold. Been, that's been a long one. 50, yep. forget about it. 5543. Uh, that was your former all time high as well, your all time closing high. You're trading only 50 cents above that. So that could act as support. I mean, all these charts are starting to look the same here, right? They're, they're blasting out the new all time highs. This one's a little bit thicker of a stock. So just keep in your mind to move this yeah. thing 84 cents during the pre market. You're going to have to trade a lot of stock. And what have we traded so far? Uh, we've, we've traded some decent volume. Maybe get this one to get you know held down on the open with stock in the book. Uh, 55.23 would fill the gap from yesterday. Also reporting this morning, USB, another bank reporting. Have we got the USB report? Because I haven't seen any trades on it yet. Uh, it's due to report. Uh, I see 88 cents, which is in line with the estimate. Okay, so just sitting here, nobody knows what to do with that. So just, everybody's scared on the bank earnings now. After you see Goldman, everybody blown away, and then they sell them. They don't even know what to do with this. So there hasn't even been one trade here, not even really bid or offered, really, either. Best bid's way down 52 to 77. Best offer's way up at 54.95. So you can say that the market is a little bit cautious in the pre-market when trading these bank earnings after we've seen some wild rides as of late. The only thing I'll point out here is you've had eight consecutive highs within a very narrow range. So you had a seller lurking over the last eight trading sessions. That goes from 54 and a quarter all the way up to the recent high of the move at 54, 42, I believe. Nope, 44. So clears that, you know, good lights out for that on the upside. But uh, that's a really nice level. See if they'll be there for the ninth day in a row. And then super value SVU. I do have a trading position on in this one. Uh, stock is trading up in the pre market. They report earnings this morning. Yep. SVU reporting Q2 EPS 46 cents versus a 35 cent estimate. Nice 11 cent beat there. Sales of 3.8 versus 3.78 billion dollars. So a slight beat on the sales. Uh, they also reporting Q2 comps were down three and a half uh, percent. And uh, they also announced a couple of acquisitions. Stock up 4% in the pre-market. It's going to be a tough one. Tough one to call. I've got a trading position. I'll limit my comments. Joel, thoughts? Uh, man, I'm trying to figure out uh, whether you're long or you're short here, but I'm not going to hazard <laughs> it. I'm not going to hazard a guess on the show. Uh, 2020, uh, that's where you're trading at the highs of the pre-market session. Let's look at the dailies and hmm, low the move yesterday at 1850. Uh, your two day high in super value. This thing got uh, this thing got Amazon just like everybody else, right? Also, two oh, day, no. yeah, two day highs, 2022. You're trading at 2020. So that's your resistance here. Let's see if that holds. Overhead supply, you could say, but then also you could say shorts heading for cover on this one. Uh, if you really get going um, into a rally mode, 
your three-day high is way up at 2070. Jump over here to ratings land because we got some huge ones here this morning. I'm going to go right to Chipotle. CMG is getting downgraded at Bank of America. What are they downgrading it to, Spencer, on this one? Because this one's down nine bucks on this. CMG, is this an underperform or a sell? Me, what, what do they say? Let me pull it up uh, real quickly here. CM, pull it up. CMG, I'm seeing Bank America downgraded uh, to uh, underperform. It was from neutral to underperform. Okay, that's their sell rating. Yep. And did they give a price target or anything? Not that I'm or did they give any commentary? Probably. I'm just not seeing it right now. Uh, okay. I can try to find it. CMG getting absolutely annihilated on this. It's been moving. I mean, we talked about the 300. 300 level has been huge. One thing I will say is in, yep. in a lot of cases, we say overhead supply. I'm going to say underneath demand here yep. because there's a lot of people who have been short this thing saying, ooh, this is a chance for me to get out of some of my shorts. So uh, even though they're they're downgrading it here, the new trend is kind of, you know, it's it's for that nice base 300 rounding bottom starting to show life here. I think it's an opportunity to buy this pullback. I'm fading BAC on this. I think CMG, um, I think it's going to find buyers here, maybe even where it's at right now in the 320 area, um, even though it's they're saying sell, unless there's another headline coming, you know, and there's always that potential. If there was ever another equal eye headline or anything coming from CMG, all bets are off. But I think it's showing life. And, you know, I'm a kind of, you know, I, I might even be a buyer of CMG the in, I know, the, in the lower 300s. I mean, I think it was uh, at the end of last week or earlier this week, I talked about that 320 level, and it had kind of bumped its head against that a few times, went back under 300. So is 320 going to be the new 300? And we're going to find that out today here. Look at those two daily lows right there. So, I mean, big stock, you got to give it some room because you don't have – anything really to lean on under 320 here, but uh, just the way it's bid here um, in the pre-market, uh, you have three, four, 15 minute lows here at 320. I mean, especially if you took this home short into the report off the close, Bank America coming to the rescue, down eight, nine bucks. I don't know. I, I'm agreeing with you on Dennis. I like the 320 level here. One concern still, we don't know because it did have that issue and you just wonder about the earnings. When, when are they due to report? Spencer, do you have that? I know the Ooh. pro is pretty good at uh, giving Let's you that find information. Out in three seconds. Chipotle due to report on the 24th after the bell. All right, it's so about a week. I, I don't want to hold this through the report. That's one thing I don't want to do because I think it's a wild card and we don't know if there are still you know, some concerns there from the last equal issue, if that was going to show up in the report or not. But technically speaking, I kind of like it. That's where I'm at. Technically speaking, I kind of like it. I want to see so, those queso earnings is what I want to see. What do you want to say? I want to see those queso earnings, that queso, is, that queso revenue. You know they're selling queso now, so I want, I want to see that how that. I'm joking. That went over your head. A lot of thoughts here, yeah. Because isn't that what they we had the jokes on that it was actually uh, so they were trying to decide whether it tasted good or not or yeah, something. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that's that's silly. Jump over here. Earnings are continuing on the ratings parade here. You can tell I'm tired here this morning. GoPro Are you so tired? Being upgraded. I'm tired here. This has just been one of those nights and didn't get a lot of sleep. GoPro upgrade longbow to uh, buy price target 13 bucks. GoPro up four and a half percent in the pre market. I can get on board with this one. I mean, that nine dollar level. It's you know, I don't know if there's value here or not because the company isn't making any money, but there's definitely some support down here. GoPro. I mean, do we even need to talk about the earnings in this thing? I mean, it's, well, there's no uh, earnings. It's not earnings. Upgrade. I'm sorry. Upgrade here. Uh, trading up in the pre-market, you had a 9.23 close. I don't know. Trading up at 9.65. I mean, can we get to 9.95? Can we get to double digits? I don't know. That's another That'll 30 cents. Yeah. I mean, several highs along the way here. Uh, pre-market high, 9.70. Your two-day high, 9.74, 9.79. So a lot of resistance here. Definitely not chasing this one on the long, long bow upgrade. Ulta Beauty, which has been annihilated uh, really this year, getting downgraded here at Piper. I feel like Piper very late to the party. This is an analyst chase price for me. 315 bucks we were, and this was just in June. Now, if you look at it in October, we're, we were under 200 bucks. We're back under 200 bucks here this morning. One thing I will say is you kind of found a bottom there in the 188, 190 area. So if we were to, for whatever reason, get down to the low 190s again, I think, again, you have underneath demand here now. 
So I'm actually, I think, a buyer of this pullback too. I'm fading these analysts. Man, today, you're going to be buying a lot of uh, Alta. CMG and, and Alta. <laughs> Ooh, this sounds horrible. For now, these are not investments. These are for trades. But I, I don't know. I think I'd be a buyer of this. Uh, step Pull up, back. yeah. After you made that low at eighty-seven ninety-six, a step up buyer in the last two sessions. So there is a buyer out there lurking here in Alta. Your pre-market low is one ninety-six. Uh, yesterday's low, 195.27. So I think it, it's important if it gets under 196 to see what happens at 195.27. Your two day low is 192.10. And, uh, you know, speaking of beauty stocks, um, have you seen Estee Lauder lately, Dennis? So it's a monster. We yeah. talked about this on the show, uh, for, you know, a couple I days ago. Upgraded a couple, couple days ago, but it's been a monster mover. Uh, what's what's so different about it? I mean, I don't know. We, we, we were asking that two days ago, and we could never figured it out. Why well, Estee Lauder gets a pass on all this? Um, I did uh, look, and they do sell on Amazon, so I don't know. Uh, we'll see what happens, but uh, we'll see what happens. Some of these other beauty stocks. What's the uh, the symbol on um, Sally Beauty? SBH. Is that it? Or is that Smith Barney, Dennis? Yeah, you got her, Joel. SBH. Remember Smith Barney? Wasn't that SBH <laughs> yeah. as well? Joel's dating himself again. Yeah, I remember Smith Barney. <laughs> Travelers bought them, didn't they? I think so. 1710, the low of the move of that one. But uh, let's see if people are going to fade that all to downgrade. Elf Beauty, too, is another one the spinner's giving us ELF. And you know what? That one's showing some life, ELF here, too. But again, you got a ELTA down here this morning. I I don't know. I'm I'm kind of liking that one, too. So MGM downgraded to uh, at Stiefel here this morning. It is trained down the pre-market. We haven't talked about the casino stocks in a while. It had a nice candle yesterday. I mean, if you get back down the 29 and a half area, there's major support down here too. So I guess BTFD here this morning for me. Yeah, look at you, Dennis. You got those, uh, well, oh. you're not looking at the spoos, you're looking at the spiders, but uh, they're up here. MGM downgraded here. I mean, unfortunately, C stocks got hit uh, over the events a few weeks ago, but uh, a double bottom, if you like double bottoms, uh, actually you got almost a triple bottom in here from 2956 to 2963. You haven't reached that yet. So that's the major support. And uh, if you get, see if you can even get green on the session, uh, 30.49. And uh, just, you know, we're talking all these upgrades and downgrades, right? And, um, you know, we talk about how stocks react to news. How about Ford the other day? Caught that downgrade, right? Was it by Barclays or who else downgraded them a couple? Someone downgraded them a couple yeah, of days right ago. Right in their face. Came yep, right back. Yep. And then it came back and filled the gap. And now it's back up. All kinds of resistance here at 1240 and change in four. There really is up there. That was, our, that was RBC. Up forward. Our Barclays, RBC. Barclays and RBC with the yeah, downgrade yep. the last two, week. Two downgrades since the 13th. And uh, we've added some gains. So, if you want to fade analyst here, uh, here's an example of how it works out. Uh, just interesting, too, is that GM and Ford went opposite directions the last couple of days. General Motors had a tough day yesterday, and Ford was up. A lot of people pair those together. Well, maybe Ford playing a little bit of catch-up because we know GM had the incredible move there, and Ford was lagging behind, but not so much lately, where Ford uh, yesterday had a nice pop, and GM was down almost a buck. Yeah, and how did that short work out for you yesterday? I know what you cover on the open. Short what? You were short was GM. Short? Was it yesterday or the day before? I was short GM. I I remember your trades more than you do. Okay. I have too many. <laughs> you, were uh, you know what? I'm actually light this morning. So I only have one on overnight. I had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, <laughs> I only had 13 trades overnight. That is as light as it gets. A lot of times I have 30 to 50. So that is light. So, and you can tell it must just be, you know, it's low volatility, not much happening, you know, and I didn't have a lot of overnight trades here. So I'll maybe remember these ones, but I don't even remember. GM, I trade almost every day though. Really? So whether I'm long or short, almost every day. I mean, it's one of those that it just, you know, anything that, you know, is big and liquid like that. I'm always trading. How does that like go with fair stuff. value when, when there's no news? Not really lately. You know, GM will have a correlation with the S&P. But I would say not much as of late. It's kind of its own animal just because it's so many headlines, you know, and it's so much momentum was driving it for the last month. So when the momentum train comes in, fair value gets thrown out the window. Fuzzy wants to know how you manage 50 trades. 
Go when when <laughs> when the market you know when the market opens that's when it gets interesting at nine thirty because you get P and going everywhere. <laughs> so it depends. So when I'm managing fifty trades and uh, I'm getting you know these positions on, I always try to trade market neutral. So if I'm you know long and it's not necessarily you know I might be long thirty stocks, short twenty. I'll probably short some spy against it. So I want to be like dollar neutral. I'm usually market neutral trading. So I'm just trying to extract whatever alpha from my strategies and I don't want to get crashed. So if like to so say, for example, I had 40 longs, 10 shorts. Well, if the market goes up tomorrow, I'm going to make a lot of money no matter what, just because the market's up. If the market goes down tomorrow, I'm going to lose a lot of money no matter what, just because the market's down and I had 40 longs. But when I trade market neutral, what I'm trying to do in all my various strategies, you know, well, I've got technicals thrown in, I've got fair value. You know, I look at imbalances, you know, you, you know, the strategies. I've been talking to the show to you guys for four years. So there's all kinds of different things I'm employing. But, you know, I don't want to, you know, get into a position where the market is going to impact, you know, my alpha. So I'm trying to extract alpha. So that's why I try to stay market neutral. So as I'm getting out of stocks, I'm trying to still stay market neutral. And in this environment, it doesn't matter as much. The s and only moving around one or two points. not going to affect it. But, you know, I've been doing these strategies for 17 years. And when the S&P futures are moving around seven, eight, ten points at a time, your p is moving big time there. So if the S&Ps are really moving higher, you know, I might be, you know, working out of whatever I can, but still trying to stay market neutral, you know, cover along, do a short, whatever, you know, it, just to make sure that I'm staying that market neutral. But Basically, when the market opens, and if it's a lot of opening trades that I was doing, so let's say, you know, off the open, I get filled on like 20 positions. I want to be market neutral, so I do this buy first. But then what I want to do is go to my losers, and I try to cut my losers immediately because the winners kind of work out, you know, out for themselves. So I'm going right to my losers. If stuff's going red, I'm trying to work out of it. If it's not working out for whatever reason, you know, my thesis wasn't working out. And how do you know when your thesis is not working out? You start losing money. So I start losing money and start cutting those losers. You know, get out of that, get out of that, get out of that. The winners, I kind of let them do their own thing. And sometimes I'll look back and like, holy cow, I'm up a lot in that now. So those winners will make up for themselves. So that's why, you know, when you're trading that kind of stuff, you've just got, when you've got that many positions on, you kind of look at your overall, you know, risk, which is, you know, how, you know, where am I, am I long, short, you know, how many hundreds of thousands of dollars am I long, how many hundreds of thousands of dollars am I short and, you know, doing the equivalent and then just working out of the losers. Uh, Dennis. This, I, I quick, quick question. Because you're uh, always market neutral, do you do you always know exactly the ratio of longs and shorts, or do you, do you have a general idea in your head? Or it's right there. That's all I'm looking at. When I have 50 positions, so I've got it right at the bottom. I can just see my value. So it's got my net value. So if I was long 100,000 you know, worth of stock, this is a hypothetical example. Let's say long 500,000 worth of stock, short 300,000. You know, it's going to show up, and it's all added up from those 50 positions. I'll show net long 200,000. Then I'm going to turn around and say, okay, well, you know, I've got to kind of understand my own beta of a little bit of what I've got. If I'm long a bunch of Netflix, it's going to have a bigger beta than the overall market. But overall, I'm trying, you know, in a, in a perfect world, the betas you aren't considering, I would maybe short 200,000 worth of spy right off the bat just to get myself market neutral. So let's, you know, I'm, that's just the hypothetical situation I'm setting up. If I got filled on $500,000 worth of longs and $300,000 worth of shorts, I'm net long 200,000. I'm going to go to the spy, maybe short 200,000 worth of spy just to get myself market neutral. Now I'm market neutral. Now I take the market out of the equation. Now I can kind of work out of my trades as I like a little bit more. I don't have to panic where, holy cow, you know, this market's flying around here and my p and is really volatile. It will kill the volatility of my p and by just being market neutral. So it, it may, my p and actually stabilizes because, of, um, because I'm market neutral, if that makes sense. But the question's flying out of this, so now I've, I went on a whole tangent. Fuzzy saying, how do you rate your beta for your portfolio? Um, you can bring he them up. It. You can get those betas. <laughs> easy to get that information, you know, on, on probably much at all of your trading platforms out there. A lot of times I just know, too, like it's feel. I want to hedge, and I, I try to hedge with – it's not just like I hedge any stock with any stock. Like if I've got, you know, a bunch of JP Morgan on, well, financials are their own animal right now. But banks move with banks. So if I'm long a bunch of JP Morgan, I'm going to be short a bunch of Bank America against it. So I'm still kind of paired off in the industries as well. So it's not just like random stock versus random stock and hoping for the best. But, you know, there's a lot of other factors that go into that. I mean, what do you, what the hell do you hedge? You know, there's certain stocks, you know, like that you just can't hedge anything with too. Like Netflix, you know, you can say, okay, well, it moves with Bang, it moves with other techs, it moves with Qs. But it's kind of its own animal right now too. So it's not really a lot of pure hedges for that. 
So it all depends on the strategies and it all depends on why I'm in those different positions. And I'm going to go to the riskier ones and manage those a little bit more. If I've got a conservative position on like Procter & Gamble, I might not look at that one off the hop because it's not going to move around that much. Always about managing risk. All right. Uh, and that's, I think, a great segue to our next guest, Tom Thornton of uh, Hedge Fund Telemetry. He sort of, he cut his teeth as a uh, portfolio manager and he's, he's offered a newsletter uh, to hedge fund uh, managers for years and now he offers it to, uh, to the masses. So we'll be right back with Tom Thornton of Hedge Fund Telemetry. Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by Benzinga Pro. I'm your co-host, Joel Alconnan, along with Dennis Dick, Spencer Israel, working the boards. And we are joined by Tom Thornton of Hedge Fund Tomology. Uh, he was suggested to us by Flack UK. Tom, how are you doing today? Hey, guys, I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for having me on. So with your hedge fund to Malachi letter, do you just do you just put out just buy everything every day? That's all you do. You just put you just put out to everyone. Just buy. Take the sell button off your uh, off your uh, screen or off your computer. I, you know, quite honestly, I, I'm I've been recommending for months to take down exposure and it's not saying, you know, let's, you know, push in all the chips, go short here. Uh, but I've been saying more like um, Howard Marks call uh, at Oak Tree saying, look, just take some risk off. I'm actually very surprised the market has moved uh, as much as it has. Uh, it's been a, an incredible market. I was on a conference call yesterday with Tom DeMarc, who's probably the best uh, market timer I know. And he just said it's just remarkable uh, what's happened in the last month. Uh, September is usually a terrible month. It was uh, the lowest volatility ever. Uh, we've had 350 days, I think, of or without a 5% pullback. And what I'm seeing right now, and, and let me give you a little uh, background of what I do. I look at sentiment, market sentiment, and uh, it, everything is very, very complacent, very overly bullish. Uh, to give you an example, people all know the CNN uh, fear and greed. That's at 78%. I use daily sentiment index, which is a daily poll. The S&P is currently at 85% bulls. That is an extreme, extreme level. And we also have investors intelligence that just came out this morning. And that's at 60% bulls. And they call that the danger zone. So I, I look at this um, and then I, uh, I, I overlay it with uh, other indicators uh, that are non-correlated. Like I said, I, I use uh, Tom DeMarc's indicators and I use them a little different than other people. I don't go for just the short term uh, type of things, but I look at longer term. I look at monthly charts that have these upside exhaustion indicators. Um, and they also work very well on the downside as well. I, I, yeah, everybody thinks that they're always trying to catch a, a top, but they do work pretty well on the downside um, when they exhaust. All right, um, let's back it up a little bit and uh, get your background, former portfolio manager, senior trader, technical analyst with uh, Level Global Investors and Galio Capital. Uh, just uh, tell us how you cut your teeth in the industry. Okay. Well, I, I started off um, – I started off in the, on the brokerage side and I worked with a high net worth uh, group and we also covered some small to mid-size hedge funds. And I got recruited um, around 2000 to go work uh, for a billion dollar hedge fund. It was market neutral. Uh, we also had a, um, a portion in science and technology. So it was a pretty exciting time with uh, technology and biotechs 
in 2000 exciting in the sense that things really, really moved, unlike uh, things that are happening today. I um, I did that for a few years, and I was recruited to come to Connecticut to work for a, a $500 million startup uh, called Level Global. I worked uh, for the firm for eight years. I wore a lot of hats, senior trader, technical analyst. I looked at all the sentiment for the firm as well. I um, was the I had my own carve out within the portfolio, uh, which is a lot of fun and truly a lot of stress as well. I will I'll be quite quite frank with that. Uh, the firm uh, the firm shut down uh, over uh, an insider trading uh, scandal, which uh, at the end of the day nobody was found guilty, uh, but reputations were were hit and um, careers uh, uh, really uh, broken up. So. I ended up going back to work for the founder of the firm uh, at his family office, and then, um, which was a hedge fund. And uh, I started uh, hedge fund telemetry this year because I started handling, handing out um, a daily note to uh, some large hedge fund people, um, people that, uh, you know, Paul Tudor Jones, Ray Dalio, uh, people I knew uh, from, you know, where I live in, in Greenwich, Connecticut. and. As it turned out, I went on Twitter in February and I asked everybody if they wanted uh, my daily note and I got 300 people that day. And so this became a business and I'm doing it full time. I put out a daily note uh, that goes into the technicals of the market. Uh, it's, it's top down, looks at sentiment. And uh, I think I'm the only one out there that puts out daily signals on the upside and downside for DeMarc analysis. All right. Now you mentioned those extreme uh, sentiment readings. Can you uh, touch on when you've seen such extremes and uh, what's been the outcome? Okay. So the the thing is with um, the daily sentiment index, it's in the high eighties right now, 85. And it's been there um, for, for probably about uh, three weeks now. Sentiment is a condition. It's not a trigger. Uh, sentiment can stay elevated for uh, weeks, months, uh, for a period of time. Uh, what I'm looking for right now are triggers that will tell me when the market will turn. And currently, <clears throat> I have some DeMarc uh, exhaustion signals on the S&P futures, which is on the t it's on the 12th day of 13. Uh, the Dow is on the 12th day of 13. And what tends to happen is within about 12 days after one of those signals, we should see uh, a reaction, a reaction lower. Uh, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not sure we're going to get, you know, the, you know, giant uh, move lower, but I would be willing to bet that uh, a, a two to 3% pullback, which is what we've typically seen over the last year is likely. And really, maybe I'm undercutting myself. It's, it may sound really rather boring, but uh, this has been a rather boring market. And uh, looking at your technical indicators, uh, uh, what what indicators do you like to use and what time frames do you look at? Well, I, I'm, I'm not a day trader and I tend to look at weeks um, to months uh, on trades. Uh, a good example of one trade that uh, we liked recently uh, was Intel. It was trading around $34. We had a downside exhaustion signal, uh, which uh, we highlighted on uh, August 23rd. And there weren't a lot of people talking about Intel at that time, but they did like uh, NVIDIA. And the SOX index and the SMH had been acting great all year. So we, we recommended going long Intel and up around 39, a uh, little over 39, we uh, had an upside exhaustion signal. So we uh, took the trade off for 15 um, for a 15 percent gain, and uh, that was that was fine for now. And so we'll we'll just go on the sidelines. Uh, but that was um, you know that was a, a, a two month trade, and it, it sometimes they come out of uh, out of nowhere really. Could you uh, give us the characteristics of your exhaustion signals uh, without giving away your secret sauce? Well, it's there's a lot there's a lot to the Demarc signals, um, but essentially it is a trend 
uh, it spots trends and then spots trend exhaustions. And uh, there are essentially there are two set up, there are two things that set up here. Uh, we have the setup, which is um, when you have a count on the upside or downside. Let's say on the upside, where you get a new number every um, if if you close higher than four bars previous, uh, and if you continue to nine, uh, that is a uh, an upside exhaustion. And we, we've we've certainly seen that with uh, in the last month the way the market's been trading. Uh, very uh, peculiar. I have a couple things that are really strange right now. The daily range, the five day daily range we've uh, just had is uh, 0.3 or 0.3, so three uh, 30 bips. This is uh, the narrowest I've ever seen. And yesterday we had a new high on the S&P, uh, but we also had the year low in volume, 52 week low in, in daily volume. And I've never seen that happen before. Uh, so we're really, um, what one of the things that um, exhaustion signals do is it, it's not necessarily you have an influx of, of sellers coming into the market. You just run out of people buying. So you've had this terrible low volume on the way up. And it, it just, the bottom line, we, we could just stall out here and, and, and give back. Uh, it's not going to happen today. Uh, you have the IBM acting very well, uh, as we, you guys have talked about. And that's, um, you know, it's a big Dow name. So we're, we're probably going to see uh, an exhaustion in the Dow over the next two days. And I think that's, uh, that, that's highly likely. Some, some areas I do like on the long side, I still like banks, even with the, the pullback. I think it's uh, a good place to be. You have the two-year or the two-year Yield keeps going higher. It's at 1.56% uh, 1 today. And as long as the two-year goes higher, uh, or the yield goes higher there, I think banks will work. And so you've had uh, a nice pullback uh, and an, an uptrend. Uh, so you can uh, you can get in there and, and buy some banks. I like uh, Goldman, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America. I'd buy those. Um, you still have upside to mark counts around uh, day eight of 13. So you still have... Uh, some upside left uh, before they get exhausted. Uh, Apple, I think, can still go higher, uh, even though I'm reading that uh, the iPhone 7 is out selling the iPhone 8, which is um, a, a really negative signal. Uh, but I, I think there's a lot of anticipation for the uh, iPhone uh, 10 or X. Uh, so I think that's, um, I think Apple's still going to work higher. Uh, Netflix, I'd sell it here. And I'm actually uh, putting out a sell signal in Japan uh, for the, some of the mar uh, macro uh, people out there. Tom, Dennis Dick here. Couple questions. You know, one, you know, you look at sentiment closely here and it's at all time high or, or you know, it's at extreme highs, you know, if I'm looking at your website there. What do you make of, you know, just this relentless, you know, bull market here like why is it always you know just seem steady climb steady climb steady climb i mean i you know me and joel have been trying to you know say okay well it looks like you know multiple times that it could be topping out or we have topping patterns and then just another sector comes around and it just picks up the slack too what do you think the real driver is behind you know just a straight up low volatile market well i think the narrative um that people are really betting on and they've they've been betting on this um since trump was elected was tax reform and tax cuts. And if the tax rate drops to 20%, which I think is gonna happen, um, that's a 35% jump in earnings. Uh, so I, I think there's a lot of ex expectations uh, for tax cuts and tax reform. And you know, honestly, if they, they pass it, it could be a sell the news. Because look, the, the, as soon as they started really ramping up in September, talking about tax cuts, uh, the Russell went up 12%. And the Russell obviously is going to be a big beneficiary of, of tax cuts. So I, I think that um, the, the narrative is just anticipating waiting, waiting, and waiting for tax cuts to be passed. And you know, honestly, I, I'm not sure anything is going to get passed uh, the way Washington works these days. Jump over here, just one other sector. Um, what do you think of 
you know, gold and silver here because it's actually, you know, in this type of market, you'd expect gold to be right down near the lows because always, you know, they say it kind of moves counter to the market, but it really hasn't been the case in 2017. I mean, gold is up about 12% this year and silver itself is up, well, we're up a little bit in silver here, but what do you think about gold and silver here and not performing that poorly in an environment where stocks have done very well? You know, you're right. Uh, it hasn't done that. It doesn't, hasn't done that that bad, um, but I think it I think it's going lower, and I I think you're going to see uh, perhaps the 1220 uh, targeted again. I, I still have downside exhaustion or downside countdowns uh, that are in play right now. So I'm on day eight of 13 uh, for downside count, and the upside count uh, occurred on where was it? On 829. And that was around 1331. So I, at that point, I, I went out and I said, sell gold. And I, I can't tell you how many people hit me on Twitter and just went ape shit on me, just saying, I can't believe you're it's breaking out. And it, look, it went up a little higher, but uh, the signal worked and it went a little lower uh, after that. So I, I'm not necessarily super bearish on gold. I, I just feel like um, it's going to drift um, a little lower. I did have. Um, a conversation with uh, a, a, f- a ex fund manager. Uh, his name's Peter Borish. Uh, Peter was the right hand man for Paul Tudor Jones uh, in the heyday, uh, and he he thinks gold's going under twelve hundred. And I, I'm not going to make that call, but certainly anything's possible. We've been on with Tom Thornton. Hedge Fund Telemetry is his site, hedgefundtelemetry.com, to learn more uh, about his service. Tom, thanks so much for the insights. We uh, we will definitely uh, keep in touch and uh, have a good day. Sounds great, guys. Take care. All right, 8.51 now. Uh, any any big movements that we missed in the past 15 minutes? I, mean, I didn't see any news while Tom was, uh, while, while Tom was talking. I mean, you've got some stocks really moving here this morning. Financials look fairly strong. I mean, IBM's up 10 bucks, so it's obviously going to be a leader in the Dow. It's going to drive it higher. Uh, but really, when I'm looking at my screen, it's kind of green across the board. There's a lot of different stocks that are catching a bit here this morning. Even some of your momos like Alibaba, which, like we talk about, seems to be up every day that we come in. Baba's got 118,000 shares to buy here this morning. It's trading up another dollar seventy-two. Square again, 77,000 to buy. It's trading up 37 cents here. Had a little bit of a pullback yesterday, but again, it's right back up here once again today. But just jumping in, you know, and looking like your financials are up. You've got stocks like U.S. Steel trading higher here this morning. You've got stocks like your retail stocks showing some strength here this morning. I know you had some Kohl's, uh, you know, a uh, little bit further information with that Amazon deal that they're putting together or Amazon partnership. And, you know, that's helping it out as well. But I'm just looking at my screen and I see a lot of green, not huge green, but a lot of green. Also uh, constellation brands still hot, hot, hot. They had their earnings. What last week? That, that's How do you a, stop the jack? That's at an all time high right now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, can't stop you it. drink during market you know when, when you drink you drink to celebrate when the market's going up you drink to you know so to, <laughs> to make yourself feel better when the market's going down so bottom line you just drink constellation brands the eternal bull stock <laughs> uh you did get some odd lots here trading up on that so less than 200 shares of uh have traded uh, what I want to talk a little bit about Square yesterday, Dennis. I thought you were holding that one overnight here and that topping formation there. Were we able to wiggle out of that one? Uh, four highs now in the same I sold area. the open. Yeah, you sold the open? Good yeah, which you. was a good sale because it went straight down after the open. So it actually didn't open up. Uh, it uh, it ended up tanking right after the open. Coming back, though, again. What do you think? I, I agree here, Joel. I, I'm, I think, you know, you got one, two, three, four highs in the same area. So. Resistance very well defined in the 3330 area. So I'd say I, I'd be a seller up there. Yeah, uh, four tops um, in the same area. SP is not moving a whole lot. Uh, we're still up 375 at 25, 60, 75. I guess there's just no sellers out there at all. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, crude has been moving up nicely, and you talk about another leg here, something to you know, just keep this bull market going. Uh, crude, nice move. Now, you had a recent high of the move here uh, at 53.09. Uh, this is basis of the, the December contract. Uh, let's keep an eye on that here to see if I can get back over 53. We're uh, 
fourth day in a row here trading up in the crude oil market. And uh, while the oil stocks used to be a much bigger part of the index, of course, uh, they've fallen down here with uh, the tech stocks now leading the way. Uh, but let's uh, let's just uh, move into, uh, do we get any earnings? We have any earnings after the close that we want to preview or finish up with some ratings changes? Um, I think we got Merck. Merck was upgraded to buy at Citigroup. Virtu Financial downgraded at JP Morgan. Anything else we missed in ratings land there, Spencer? No, we got uh, the big ratings. The bulk of it. Uh, as far as earnings after the bell, well, we've got eBay. We've got uh, American Express after the bell. We have uh, UAL, United Air after the bell. Alcoa is after the bell. Uh, Steel Dynamics. Those are those are the big ones. So we can go uh, any of those. I would say uh, is, is 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 cool. Those are those are from what I'm seeing uh, on this list here. Those are the biggest stocks reporting. But let's do eBay. All right, uh, eBay. Let's take a look at that. Um, I think I saw something about uh, PayPal surpassing somebody in market cap. Who was it? Was it? Um, gosh, I can't remember who it was. It you was, ever seen that headline? It was that PayPal here. Let me pull it up right now. It was. Um, PayPal has two million. Uh, two more. So PayPal owns uh, Venmo, and Venmo now has two million retailers uh, through which it is it is accepted, which is uh, which is a lot. Um, so PayPal, I, I don't know about market cap or anything uh, who they overtook, but PayPal is is, is doing good. All right, uh, eBay here ahead of the report. You got nice support here at the thirty seven fifty area. Close kind of week, so uh, we'll see if, in fact, trading up 11 cents here. But uh, you had a 37.42 low from yesterday and then uh, going back a 37.44. So there's your support there in eBay, uh, PayPal. I know that thing is uh, been on, it's on fire this morning. It got pitched on fast money yesterday by Tim uh, Seymour. Crazy how much these guys move the stocks. Like I cannot believe, you know, they come on and they do this. They do this thing like I don't know, three or four times a week on CNBC Fast Money, and it's a pitch. And the one CNBC guy will say, you know, the stock that he likes, and they all decide whether they like it or not. It kind of sounds silly, but man, they move stocks. You got to respect those guys. They are market movers, man. I mean. This thing was at 66.75, doing nothing. Tim Seymour pitches it, and boom, everybody's buy, buy, buy after hours. It's going 67.10, 67.20. It just continues here after hours, 67.36 here now. So, you know, props to Tim Seymour to be in, as influential as he is. And these guys on Fast Money are influential, man. If you're trading PayPal here, yesterday's high, 67.67, uh, sold off to a low of 66.35. So, Keep an eye on that. Haven't uh, quite got up there yet this morning. Um, above that, uh, you have a big gap up to the 69 handle, but I'll uh, be keeping an eye on 69, 67 here. Uh, the close way down uh, under 67 bucks. It's boy, a lot of sixes here. It's 66.67. Uh, just want to do a quick look at uh, Apple here. Uh, nice run here, gearing up for its earnings report, I believe, in a couple weeks. 16088 that's your pre-market high uh dennis uh, you haven't mentioned apple much lately uh any comments on that still long it i've been long apple forever sticking with apple i mean it's come back here i had the extra shares that i had sold remember i had it on for like a little bit of an extra investment there from the 105 to 140 area and i sold the extra so i just got my original position that i picked up well back in the day I'm sticking with Apple. I mean, I still think this is a perfect example of gar growth at a reasonable price. This is my kind of stock. 160.88, that's your pre-market high, only hanging 15 cents off that, or uh, 14 cents at 160.74. I alert our traders that your a September 15th high was 160.97, and that was a big volume day in the stock. So see what happens at 161. Uh, Spencer? Uh, Go ahead. You got anything else? I was Dennis? going to give you a few more imbalances here. Sure, go ahead. Sure some of them are really like that information. Coca Cola, 131,000 to sell. IBM with its uh, being up 10 bucks, it's 219,000 to buy here this morning. Johnson Johnson, Johnson J and J, 55,000 to sell. I've got Pfizer, 71,000 to sell. General Electric, 70,000 to sell. Twitter, 88,000 to sell. So there's a few sell imbalances out there, but then there's on the other side, Square, 79,000 to buy. Bob, 133,000 to buy. TNT, 73,000 to buy here this morning. Chevron, 34,000 to sell. 
Uh, I don't think we mentioned Sock, Jen, and BMO both downgrading Chevron this morning. So the double downgrade tr- trick for CVX. Walmart, 21000 to buy here this morning. Bristol Myers, 28000 to sell. Wells Fargo, 42000 to sell. But again, financial strong. I'd expect that selling balance to maybe flip as you get closer to the open. Uh, Ford, 67000 to sell. Joel was mentioning the 1240, 1250 major resistance up there for Ford. General Motors, small sell balance of 20,000 shares. So there's a few out there this morning. Uh, Dennis, uh, what about the run of J&J yesterday? Did you, uh, oh, did you get hurt in that at all? No. And this thing just blasted off. I mean, it reported. They bought it right from the get-go, and it was gone. I mean, J&J, that's just an impressive move. All right, Spencer, what's on the docket for tomorrow? Uh, on the docket for tomorrow's show, as of now, uh, we'll be joined by Fari Hamzi. I am though working on getting a couple of guests, if I can swing it. Uh, some people who were on the floor uh, during the crash of '87, seeing as how tomorrow is the uh, the anniversary uh, of that. But again, Fari Hamzi on the books as of now for tomorrow's show. If you want to catch any part of our show uh, again or our interview with Tom Thornton of Hedge Fund Telemetry, you can do so by going to youtube.com slash TV or catching our podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher by searching for Pre-Market or Benzinga on any of those sites. That's it for our show today, folks. Everyone have a good rest of your day. We'll be back with you on Thursday.